All right, so on to actual chemistry stuff here. Um, I want to talk to you today about our next major topic, one that you've already explored in your lab, but one that we're going to talk about in greater detail here. All right, so we're going to talk about relationships between pressure, volume, and temperature. I want to get through this quickly because I want to work problems and because I've also already given up 20 minutes of class time for my little diatribe there. All right, so when we're talking about pressure, volume, and temperature, there are three separate relationships that you could look at. And we talked about all three in the lab, although we only did two of them, of course, in class. And then the third one was in your conclusion question. They have names. You don't have to know these, but they're named after the people that first described these relationships correctly. So, for example, um, one of the founders of modern chemistry, Robert Boyle, was the person who looked at the relationship between pressure and volume, which is what you did first in the lab with the syringe, right? Um, and found um, that, well, first of all, there's two different ways to look at pressure. There's a pressure of a gas inside a container, and then there's a pressure on the outside of a container. So if I like squeeze or expand a container, um, then uh, that's different than the pressure inside. In summary though, what, Robert Boyle found was that uh, pressure and volume are inversely proportional to, proportional to each other. Um, with the, when the volume goes up, the pressure goes down, which is the relationship you should have seen in your lab. As we increase the milliliters of volume, then the pressure would drop on it, or vice versa had we chosen to do that. When you put an inverse relationship into mathematical form, it means the terms are multiplied by each other. So when two terms are multiplied in an equation, those two terms are in an inverse relationship. Because when two terms are multiplied, if one gets larger, then the other has to get smaller to compensate so that the value remains the same. Um, so that's the relationship that comes out of the first part of your lab. But when I want to talk about the ones and twos in this equation here. So what we're essentially saying is that pressure times volume is constant. Right? So anytime I take a gas, one sample, if I multiply its pressure times its volume, then that product will remain constant. If I change the pressure, then the volume will also change and will still end up with the same constant. And so that's what we're describing with this particular formula here. So when I say P1 and V1, what I mean are the initial pressure and volume for the gas, and then P2 and V2 are the final pressure and volume, which means that there's something changing in there. I can change the pressure myself, or I could change the volume, but in the end, whichever one I don't change myself is going to change spontaneously to compensate. So if I raise the pressure, then the volume will decrease. If I increase the volume, then the pressure will decrease. And we can use this formula to calculate these changes. There's a little sample problem here, but I find that this is a lot better when we do problems by hand. And so that's what I'm going to work towards is getting some problems done by hand for you. Okay. Charles law is the next relationship. And this has to do with volume and temperature. So this is the one that would have been in the conclusion question for you um, that you were asked to describe um, a simple experiment for. So volume and temperature are directly proportional to each other. When things are directly proportional, they exist in a fraction form. So instead of V times T, it's V over T. And this is important because we're going to assemble this into one equation. So while these were first described as separate relationships, they're now understood to be part of one overall relationship, which is what we're working towards. And that's called the combined gas law. And so if volume increases, then temperature can also increase. And most importantly, if I increase the temperature of a gas, then the volume of that gas will also increase, which makes sense. We've actually talked about that before. If I heat a gas, it will expand. Its volume will increase, right? And so V1 and T1 are the initial conditions. V2 and T2 are the final conditions. And so we can use this formula to solve for any of the variables. The key here in these is you have to be given three of the four values. That's true for both of these equations. And then you can solve for the fourth, which means that what we're doing in the gas laws formula is just algebra. We're solving for whichever variable um, is um, unknown. And so that's what we're gonna focus on. 
The third of them, uh, identified by a pair of scientists, and so it's called Gay-Lussac's law, um, has to do with um, pressure and temperature. I want you to notice a term, sorry, I skipped past it too fast. Uh, when we talk about a rigid container, all right? Well, a rigid container means that the volume cannot change. So that's an important term to understand. Um, oftentimes we'll simply say, uh, like if the temperature is constant, we'll say constant temperature. If the pressure is constant, we'll say constant pressure. But sometimes when we're talking about the volume remaining constant, instead of saying constant volume, um, a problem might say rigid container. You know, in a rigid container, the volume is constant and cannot change. When that happens, there are deeper explanations for these in the notes, and so you can look for those, um, but I'm just going through the most important stuff here. When we talk about pressure and temperature in a rigid container, then um, it is also a directly proportional relationship. And this was from part two of the lab. So you should have seen this exact relationship. Um, when we increase the temperature of the gas, then the pressure goes up. And that's what happened during part two of the lab. And I think I saw that for every single person. I don't think anybody had any problems with the temperature pressure data um, in class. So these are directly proportional. And again, there's an initial pressure and an initial temperature. And then we have a final pressure and a final temperature. Typically, we would change temperature because it's easy to do that. All we have to do is heat something up. Now, the note here is very important. We have to use Kelvin temperature. We cannot use Celsius in this formula because, as you've seen in uh, two of these relationships, temperature is in the denominator. Celsius has zero as one of its most prominent temperatures, and zero cannot be in the denominator of one of these calculations. Negatives also mess up the formula because um, they destroy the proportionality. So you've got a number that's decreasing till you get to zero, and then all of a sudden the value of the number begins increasing again. So it screws up the, the proportionality. And so we must use Kelvin temperatures. So make sure you're making a note that in all of these, the rest of the way through this unit, you have to convert Celsius to Kelvin. It should be the first thing that you do in any problem. And of course, that was also part of the lab as well. All right, so historically, there are these three different relationships. And again, the notes go into greater detail. If you want to understand the underlying causes, the underlying explanations of these, it's in the notes. But in the end, we're going to come out with one single formula, which is known as the combined gas law. And this is in your reference tables. And so from a practical standpoint, you don't necessarily have to understand all of the underlying reasons for why these relationships work as long as you can understand and master how to use this formula. And that's what we're going to focus on. So this is where we sort of transition here from um, understanding a, a piece of information or several pieces of information to a skill. We're going to turn to developing the skill of working with this particular equation. So again, this is in your reference tables. You don't have to memorize it. And we're going to work through several problems associated with this. But notice that it just has our three variables that we've talked about, pressure, volume, and temperature. And notice how they're arranged. Pressure and volume are multiplied, just like they were in the separate formula, which means they're inversely proportional. Pressure and temperature are divided because they're directly proportional. And volume and temperature are also divided. So I can start with this equation for any of the problems that we're going to go forward in. And sometimes we might use all three variables, but often one of them is constant and we can cancel it out of the equation. And so that's what we're going to practice here today. All right, so if something is constant, all right, then all I need to do is remove it from the equation. So if the problem says constant pressure, I just take my combined gas law formula and I remove pressure. I take P1 and P2 out of it. And when we do that, it reduces back to what we once called Charles law. So the, the lesson here is I don't need to know the three separate relationships. I just need to know the one overall, the combined gas law. And then we can always reduce that back to any of the three separate relationships very easily. Same thing again happens if we have constant volume, which again is often referred to as rigid container. So if I drop V out of the equation, then I just get pressure and temperature, um, which is Gay-Lussac's law. And again, I can also have constant temperature. And of all the things to do here, um, constant temperature is one of the hardest to achieve. Um, it's difficult to keep things at perfectly conf constant temperature in a, a laboratory setting. It's a lot easier to maintain volume or pressure. But if we do that, we get back to Boyle's law there. 
Right, and so finally, one more time, you must use Kelvin temperature in all of these. If you don't use Kelvin temperatures, you won't get the right answer, particularly um, if there are negatives or zeros that are involved in your temperatures. But even if it's not, even if they're positive Celsius temperatures, it's still not gonna work correctly because the equations are written to work with Kelvin, not with Celsius. All right, and so I've got a couple of sample problems here that I wanna work with you. And then we're gonna turn our attention to worksheets and I'll give you a chance to do a couple problems on your own. Uh, ask questions if you need to, and then we'll go forward from there. Hopefully you'll get some progress made on the worksheets here in class. And then anything that we don't finish from the worksheet, which I'll show you in just a minute, uh, becomes homework over the weekend. I will tell you though that we can work more on this in class on Monday. So Monday's class will also involve time for you to work on these and ask questions about these. So this is a two day lesson. And at the end of Monday's class, in the last 10 minutes, I'm gonna throw in one more small topic, but most of the class will still be dedicated to this. This is the main point of this unit. And this is where the bulk of the work in your packet is if you haven't already looked at it. Okay, so we're gonna do these two practice problems here. All right, the first one says the volume of a gas at 155 kilopascals, so that's a pressure, right? So that's the pressure of the gas, and the volume changes from 22 liters, so that would be the initial volume, to 10 liters, which is the final volume, right? And so I'm gonna write this out and then switch my screen right here in just a minute. So our initial pressure is 155 kilopascals, our initial volume is 22 liters, and the final volume is 10 liters, which means the thing we're looking for is our, our final pressure, which is what it asks. What is the new pressure that would be represented by P2 in this equation? All right, so let me bring up the screen or the, the camera with my whiteboard on it. There we go. Okay, and let's work through some combined gas law problems here. And I wanna remind you that the notes that we just really went through quickly um, are on Canvas for you. You can always double back to them, uh, but the expectation is from now on that you're gonna look at these notes prior to class. So make sure you're paying attention to the schedule that I give you that tells you when you're supposed to do the notes prior to the class that we're gonna talk on them. So if you haven't done them yet, you need to go back and go through those notes. All right, so we have a formula, P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. This is the combined gas law, and this is my starting point for any of these problems. I'm gonna go through this in a lot of detail. Once you've learned the formula, you probably don't need to put this much detail into your problems and that's okay. Um, you can skip over some of the, the introductory steps that I'm doing here. But the first and most important thing here is when we read the problem, the problem says constant temperature, All right? So that's something you wanna look for in any gas law problem is something being held constant. Only one thing can be held constant in any of these problems. Right? And in this case, it's temperature. And so if temperature is being held constant, it means we can remove that from the equation. It's not going to change. We don't need to include it in there. So the constant variable can be kept out of the equation. That means we're working with just pressure and volume, which is exactly what we needed. Normally, this is stated in the problem, constant temperature, but sometimes it's just implied. So if you have a problem and the only thing they give you is pressure and volume, and you're not given any temperatures, then you can assume that the temperature is being held constant. If you don't have numbers for something, then you can't calculate with it. All right, so I've got P1, let me rewrite, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, and we're solving for P2, All right? So what do I need to do to get P2 by itself in this equation? I know Mr. George is actually asking a question that requires a verbal response putting you all off your game here. What do I need to do to solve for P2? Julian, 
Would you divide both sides by V2? Correct. Right, so to isolate P2, I'm going to divide both sides by V2. Now notice when I do these equations, I rearrange the equation first in symbol form, and then I'll plug in numbers later on. Okay, and so um, for some people, they like to substitute the numbers in and then solve the equation. I prefer to solve the equation first and then substitute the numbers in. And personally, I think it prevents mistakes, and that's why I recommend this method. Rearrange the equation first and then put the numbers in and solve. But if the other way works better for you, that's okay. And I'm not going to penalize you for um, using the opposite approach. It works both ways, solve and substitute or substitute and then solve, it doesn't matter. All right, so that means my final version of the equation, P2 is going to be P1 times V1 over V2, which are all the numbers I have right here, right? So we wanna make sure that we have all these things in that right side of the equation. And notice that I flipped it around here. For whatever reason, my brain likes to have the solved variable on the left side. You don't have to do that, um, but if that's just the way that my brain works, so you'll see that in my work problems as we go forward. All right, so P2 is P1 times V1 over V2, and we're just gonna put in the numbers. P1 is 155, and you can put in units as well here, and it is a good habit to put in units for these. It's not crucial for this type of problem, um, and sometimes I don't do it because I just want to save space when I'm writing out these problems. Right? And then finally, um, over V2, which is 10.0. So that's P1, V1, and V2 plugged in. And then it just becomes a matter of us doing the math. Oops. And so 155 times 22, and then that answer divided by 10. And you may notice that when I do these, I make the calculations the same way I do when we did unit conversions in the last unit. If it's on top, you multiply. If it's on the bottom, you divide. I, I calculate the exact same way in any algebraic expression. Um, it's very simplistic, but it's very effective. It works quite well. All right, and so then the answer here is going to be 341. Okay, 341, uh, our unit is kilopascals. Don't forget your units when you're answering these questions. All right, does that make sense? Well, what we've done is we've decreased the volume, right? So we've squeezed the particles of the gas much closer together. Now, what is pressure? If you remember from earlier in the unit, pressure is collisions between the particles. All right, so if I squeeze the particles real close together, they're gonna collide more often. If they collide more often, then the pressure goes up. In this case, the pressure goes up by more than double, which is correct because the volume went down by more than a factor of two, by more than one half. And so, yes, this does make sense. And it's worth checking to make sure your things make sense, which also has the extra benefit of reviewing what each of these things means. What does it mean when I change the volume? What does it mean when I change the pressure? What does it mean when I change the temperature? So that we can keep that underlying explanation sharp in our brains or make it stronger if you, if you haven't really gotten it to click in yet. Any questions about that problem before I do my second sample problem? Then it'll be time to work. All right, in our second problem, we have 10 liters of O2, and I'll be putting this back up in just a minute. So we have an initial volume, and we have an initial temperature. So it's gonna be volume and temperature in this case, 25 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to heat that up to 100 degrees Celsius. And that means we're going to find the new volume in there. Okay, so let me put my screen back up for you. So this is the setup that we have for the problem. We're going to be looking for our new volume. Again, starting from the original equation, which you can find in your reference tables, this should be your starting point here. 
Now I realize that as you work these problems, you will not need to write out the starting equation every single time. I get that. Um, the reason why I do this whenever I solve a problem is because I never want somebody to uh, not understand one of the steps that I'm taking when I'm solving the equation. So I spell out every step in excruciating detail. Um, you definitely don't have to write this out every single problem. Um, but what I do want to see is evidence of you rearranging the equation into the right form for a particular problem. All right, so in this case, pressure is constant. And we know that simply because it wasn't mentioned at all in the problem. So we don't have any vol values for pressure. And if I don't have any values, I can't calculate it. So I take it out of the equation, leaving volume and temperature as our only two variables. And again, we're solving for V2, right? So this time I won't actually wait for an answer in an uncomfortable and awkward silence. But how do we solve for V2 and get it by itself? Well, I need to multiply both sides by T2. Right, because T2 is divided in the original equation, I have to multiply by it to get rid of it, to move it to the other side of the equation so that it cancels out. And in addition to my examples that I'm giving you here, and there's worked examples, there's a key for this, which is posted on the uh, lesson page for this lesson. Um, and this video will be posted there as well. You can also go to the lesson page and I've given you a couple more resources of videos that are just about working with the combined gas law and rearranging it like this. And so if solving the equation and rearranging it is a hang up for you, uh, first of all, let me know and we'll work on it. Uh, but be persistent and take advantage of the resources that you have and you'll get better at it. This is very much like an algebra one review here. Um, and I realize that for some people that's not their strength. Uh, for a lot of people, that's not the most fun thing that they can do. Uh, and for some people, it's been a while. And so sharpening up your basic algebra skills is very beneficial here. And I can help with that. All right, so we're solving for V2, which means we've multiplied both sides by T2. I'm going to rearrange and put V2 on the left because that's the way my brain works. V2 is T2 times V1 over T1. So I've solved the equation for V2. And now I need to put in the numbers. So then V2 is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. Now, here's where we run up against our problem. We must convert to Kelvin, right? And so these temperatures need to be converted to Kelvin. We do that by adding 273. Remember, that is also in your reference tables on the same page as the combined gas law, right? So this would be 373 Kelvin over here. And this one would be 298 Kelvin. And when you see Celsius temperatures in these problems, it's a good habit to convert them to Kelvin right away because then you don't forget to do that when you're actually making your calculation. All right, so V2 is gonna be T2, which we now know is 373 Kelvin times V1, our original volume is 10 liters. And then all of that divided by our original temperature which we now know is 298 Kelvin. Notice that in all these, we're ending up with three numbers, right? And the pattern is very similar, right? We got two on the top and one on the bottom. Um, that's very typical of combined gas law problems. When you solve these, this is the kind of thing that you end up with. We're gonna do one more complex problem later on in class, but this is the basics that we're starting with. This is the type of problem that you're gonna be doing as we work through these. All right, so the math is 373 times 10, and then that answer divided by 298, and we get 12.5. Right now, remember your units. We're talking about volume, and in these problems, the units must match. Now, I haven't given you any problems right now where the units don't match, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you're forgetting what your unit is, just look back, what's the unit for volume in this problem? It has to be consistent all the way through the problem there. Later on, of course, we'll throw in a couple unit conversions because that's just what I do. And it's an important skill to keep going. But for right now, it should be more simple. All right, so I'm gonna skip ahead. If you haven't done this, uh, gotten to this page yet, that's perfectly fine. But I'm gonna skip ahead to the last page of this chunk of worksheets, which looks like this. All right, so this assignment here is four pages. And although there's only two problems on that page. And on the fourth page of this, it says combine gas law problems. So skip ahead with me and I wanna work problem number four here. I wanna point out a couple things to you as we go through this. 
Now notice um, this term right here in problem two. So I wanna make sure that you notice that term, STP. We've talked about that once before, standard temperature and pressure, all right? You can look that up. And so what that says um, is that the initial pressure and the initial temperature are standard pressure and standard temperature. All right, and so P1 is gonna be standard pressure and T1 is gonna be standard temperature. So you go to your reference tables on the front page and find them. So that's a way of giving you your initial pressure and your initial temperature. So look out for STP, standard temperature and pressure. And when you see that, you're being given one pressure and one temperature for the problem. This one starts at STP, so it's P1 and T1, but a problem could also have it end at STP, which means it would be P2 and T2. But um, either way, you can look them up. All right, and then finally, for number four down here, I wanna talk about two things in here. I think this problem covers two things that students get hung up on a little bit. So let's work on that. I'm gonna slide that up a little bit so that you can see the board. Well, that may not work so great. All right, so we have the pressure of the gas being reduced, right, from 1200 millimeters of mercury. So that's the first pressure. to 80, 850, that's our second pressure. A lot of this is simply reading and interpreting the question and making sure you get everything in the right places. All right, and then the volume is changing from 85 to 350, oops, it's milliliters. That doesn't really matter much, but I wanna be accurate. We can use any volume unit as long as we're consistent, it has to be the same on both ends. And then we have an original temperature which was 90 degrees Celsius, which we'll need to convert to Kelvin. So 90 plus 273 oops, gives us 363 Kelvin. I'd always do that right away when I can. All right, and then we're gonna be asked to find T2. So notice that in this question, all three terms are gonna be included. So in the previous problems, we were able to cancel something out. In this problem, we're not, we have to use all the terms. And then secondly, I want to talk to you about solving for T. All right, so let's set up my equation. P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. All right, so I want to reemphasize this to you. We had this happen before when we did density, right? Density is mass over volume. If you're solving for V in the density equation, you cannot solve for it while it's in the denominator of the equation. The same thing is true here. We can't solve for T while it's in the denominator. So when you're solving for T, which is what we're doing here, the first thing you have to do is get T out of the denominator. The shortcut to that is to cross multiply. So if you're familiar with cross multiplying, then that's something that you can always do when you're solving for T in one of these equations. I'm gonna take T up here and, oh, sorry, T2 up there and T1 up there. And so the new equation is going to be P1 times B1 times T2 equals P2 times B2 times T1, All right? So I've cross multiplied the two temperature terms and gotten them up out of the denominator. Now I can solve for T2, so it's right here. And I'm gonna do that by dividing both sides by P1 and V1. And we end up with a more complicated expression because we've got all three terms in here. We haven't canceled anything out. And so I have five values on the right side that I'll need to plug in, but I know them. P2, V2, T1, I've got all those, P1 and V1. So you're gonna plug all those numbers in and then you're gonna solve for it, right? And so doing that real quickly, because I know we're just about out of time, it's 850 times 350 times our T1, which is 363, divided by P1, 1200, and then V1, which is 85. All right, so that's how we would set up the math to get T2. Now this is in the key, so you can go back and look at that from the assignment page, but I just wanted to go over that once. When you're solving for temperature, it's really important that you need to get temperature out of the denominator before you actually try to solve. All right, so we're out of time. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to stay. But otherwise, this is what you work on over the weekend. Continue to make progress on these worksheets.
After that four worksheet chunk, there's actually a few more pages. There's a lot of work on combined gas law. So make significant progress on it over the weekend. And let me know if you have any questions by email.